there. It's been a while. It's been a while, but we're back. I feel like I say that every episode. We're going to cover two chapters this time. It's really the second half. It's the second chapter that he teases us up for here. Um, for me, where the insights were really hitting. But there's going to be a bit of table setting, but it pays off. So let's follow his argumentation. So we're coming off of the profound boredom chapter, right? Of, of hyperactivity. Uh, and 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 the 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 generative power of leisure of extreme boredom where there isn't much to do where you end up finding things to do right dancing comes from comes from uh, not moving from point A to point B as effectively as possible but for, from being uh, profoundly bored and finding a new way to move uh, a strange way that you hadn't thought of before and suddenly dancing happens right he, he talked about that a little bit. Um, and really the best things, these, these great higher things that we can uh, engage with, come out of a kind of profound boredom, a kind of active contemplation, a type of deep, deep uh, contemplation. But we run into a lot of errors when we try to talk about what that thing is and how it's different from what we imagine its counterpart is, which is action. And he wants to start eroding our faith in our knee-jerk, definitions to those terms so we come to a better one uh, and it's his redemption of his redefining renegotiation of what we mean by vita contemplativa all of this will make sense bear with me So he starts this chapter here, Vita Activa, by talking about Hannah Arendt. In the human condition, Hannah Arendt seeks to rehabilitate Vita Activa against the primacy a long tradition has granted the Vita Contemplativa, and to articulate its inner richness in a new way. In her estimation, the traditional view has wrongly reduced Vita Activa to mere restlessness. Right? She's saying it's not just hyperactivity, it's got to be more than that. In reality, she says, it has a lot more to do with uh, nativity and birth and beginnings. When Heidegger talks about action, heroic action, Bjorn Chulhan calls it, when Heidegger talked about action to Arendt, he orients it around death. For early Heidegger, death provides the point of orientation. The possibility of dying imposes limits on action and makes freedom finite. In contrast, Arendt orients possible action on birth, which lends it more heroic emphasis. It isn't a thing oriented, leading up inevitably to death. For her, the Vita Activa is the, the uh, unexpected promise of a birth time, of the beginning of something. It can go anywhere. The problem for Arendt is that, as she saw it, modern society has sunken down from her idea of this kind of high-minded action at its most powerful and, and meaningful, it is sunken down to merely like animalistic labor that nullifies any possibility for action when it degrades the human being into the animal laborans, a beast of burden. Action, she maintains, occasions new possibilities, yet modern humanity passively stands at the mercy of the anonymous process of living. As she sees it, vita activa would be action that is generative and is a birth time, it is a miraculous like nativity. New things are coming, right? And instead she looks around her and she sees a passive resignation to these anonymous processes going on around us. Maybe they're acting, but this isn't the highest form of action. In fact, she thinks that people have become so passive that if you were to look at the world from far, far, far away, our activities would no longer appear as deeds, but as biological processes. Accordingly, for an observer in outer space, motorization would resemble a biological mutation. The human body surrounds itself with metal housing in a manner of a snail, like bacteria reacting to antibiotics by mutating into resistant strains. Pretty interesting, right? She's saying we are so just kind of resigned to these anonymous processes, we are not taking control and recognizing our autonomy, that if anyone looked at us from far enough away, it would be like us looking at like a snail who finds a shell, maybe a beaver who builds a dam, which we wager is very different from when we build a dam, unless our labor sinks down to what Arend is so worried about, in which case even motorization, even hopping into our cars, looks like a biological process and not an active like invention, right, of reaching beyond the animal. 
Again, Han doesn't like this, but it is interesting. And this is where Han's critique begins, right? Because for him, it isn't that we give up our individuality and our ego in late modern society. And that's what Arendt's saying. We give it up to be part of this anonymous life process. Simple labor on, and animal labor on. Han says it's, it's quite the opposite, really, in late modern society, at least. In the achievement society, individuality is fostered. What do you mean passive? He would ask her. Our ego is absolutely bursting. In fact, falling back on the, on the anonymous processes of life sounds a lot like a nice break. It sounds serene. It sounds like floating on your back in the ocean. I mean, goodness, is that essentially what we're trying to do when we put up on a pedestal the, the flow state? This is like the new TED Talk circuits, right? Everyone began managing their livelihoods in such a way that they get more flow state in. Like, we kind of want to resign to the anonymous process where our individuality goes away, mindfulness. How could it be passive? Far from it, we're hyperactive and hyperneurotic, Han says. There must be another answer to why all human activities in late modernity are sinking to the level of mere laboring, and more still, why such hectic nervousness prevails. So he agrees, labor has sunken down. This is even something Emerson wrote about in The American Scholar, right, in 1837, when we did that live stream together. But why the hectic nervousness? This is something that has not really been accounted for. For Han, it has a lot to do with this notion of living in the times of this kind of Nietzschean death of God, right? The modern loss of faith does not concern just God or the hereafter. It involves reality itself and makes human life radically fleeting. Life has never been as fleeting as it is today. Not just human life, but the world in general is becoming radically fleeting. Nothing promises duration or substance. Given this lack of being, nervousness and unease arise. The late modern ego stands utterly alone. We don't even get to be animals where we at least have a species, he's saying, right? Really turning Arendt's claim on its head. The general denarrativization of the world is reinforcing the feeling of fleetingness. It makes life bare. Work is a bare activity. The activity of bare laboring corresponds entirely to bare life. Merely working and merely living define and condition each other. Life has never felt so fleeting. A loss of faith has never denarrativized life so much. Labor has sunken down. And all we can do in the bareness of life, he says, is have an unconditional compulsion to keep bare life healthy. Nietzsche already observed that after the death of God, health rose to divine status. If a horizon of meaning extended beyond bare life, the cult of health would not be able to achieve this degree of absoluteness. Now bare sheer life itself is holy, and so it must be preserved at any cost. Right? You see what's happening there then. A dried up horizon of meaning, a loss of God, a loss of kind of these stable, solid social configurations that narrativize life in an easy way. What happens when we lose those, right? This is Nietzsche's big concern. There is this kind of all that is solid melts into air moment. Those crucial foundations gone. What do we do? And more importantly, what takes their place and does it deserve it? And in this case, our answer to the bare sheer life that he's talking about is just an obsession a deification of health to preserve that bare sheer life as long as possible. Which is funny in a very dark way, I think. And it's our reaction to that life and to this recognition, he says, that occurs as hyperactivity, hysterical work, and production. That hyperactivity and nervousness is our reaction to this new epochal malaise, this new condition we're in. Hans says, a society of laboring and achievement it's not a free society. It generates new constraints, right? It's what we've been talking about in the, over these last few chapters, right? It's, it's a coming to terms with this idea that exploitation is possible even without domination. One exploits oneself. Everyone becomes then master and laborer, all kind of simultaneously. This, is, this works well with the reading we did on Postscript from Deleuze. It works well with the Mark Fisher reading series here on the public channel, where we talk about this uh, this movement from Fortis to post-Fortis working conditions, where what masquerades around as a great deal of autonomy has this exhausting quality to it, right? So for all these reasons he's saying, Arendt's take on the Vita Activa is not too compelling. And at the end of this chapter, that's really it. He just kind of punches Hannah Arendt for a little bit and says, it would seem that this emphasis on being active has made things terrible. Right? It, it seems like the hyperactivity and hysteria displayed by the late modern achievement subject arise out of this type of imperative. 
Toward the end of her discussion of Vita Activa, Arendt inadvertently endorses Vita Contemplativa. It escapes her notice that the loss of the ability to contemplate, which among other things leads to the absolutization of Vita Activa, is also responsible for the hysteria and nervousness of modern society. What he's talking about here is a quote of Cato that Hannah Arendt has at the end of her book. And she quotes it as a uh, as a kind of crucial defense of the Vita Activa, there's life of action as she's describing it. But if you look beyond the quote that she snipped out, Young Chalhan is saying it's about the Vita Contemplativa. It's about leisure. It's about sitting around and doing nothing such that we have new things again. Because that imperative to constantly be moving is where we get hyperactivity, is where we get bare life, is where we don't even have the moment to sit and think too long, right? In fact, we avoid at every cost. Think about the, if we, if, we, if we evoke Fisher's like stimulation matrix example, right? It's the, it's the I can't go on a walk because I'm always listening to Spotify on a walk. I can't really lean back into the grass because I'm always thinking about what's going on on social media or something, right? I can't even come home and experience extreme quiet because I have my uh, like background in TV shows or I have a series I'm working through or, or all this. Have you had enough slow contemplative moments in your life that you know at around what time of the day the sunlight arcs into your room and how the geometric domestic shadows kind of print themselves onto the wall, onto the floor and stretch in different ways? It's around 12, it'll look like that, right? It's around 5 p.m., it'll look like that. Can you kind of get lost in that for no reason at all? Just to do it? And do new things emerge out of that? Unexpected thoughts, unexpected realizations that have nothing to do with sunlight falling into the room, right? Or do we lose all of the potentiality to have those moments by never being in a place where we can have them? And if we are having that nervous, fidgety anxiety uh, to get out and get out and get out and get out of it. Instead, the Vita Contemplativa, Nietzsche says, is learning to see, right? Getting your eyes used to calm, to patience, to letting things come to you. That is, making yourself capable of deep and contemplative attention, casting along in slow gaze, right? You remember when he talked about the painter Cezanne, who would look at a landscape so long that he saw fragrances visually in the air, right? That he could picture them moving around probably like pollen in the wind. A very nuanced, if you if you looked at it through the right type of camera that could maybe bring out some simulation of fragrance, he, he feels like he probably sees the warring currents of air, how it might sweep up from the grass and whirl in on itself in a spiral here and go over the hill there. Uh, we're talking about a very probably interesting visualization that has very little to do with just tulips and odor coming off of them. Probably very dynamic. If you look at these impressionistic paintings, you see that dynamism in, in the painting. That does not come, that does not come from a hyperactivity. It comes from a long, slow gaze. One must learn not to react immediately to a stimulus, but instead to take control of the inhibiting, excluding instincts. Reacting immediately, yielding to every impulse already amounts to illness and represents a symptom of exhaustion. Here, Nietzsche is simply speaking of the need to revitalize the Vita Contemplativa, which is not a matter of passive affirmation, of being open to whatever happens. Instead, it offers resistance. So, Arendt says, we have to stop being passive laboring, this, this bare contemplative life. No, 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 we have to stop being so hyperactive that we have no time for long, slow gazes for Vita Contemplativa. In this way, the Vita Contemplativa is very active, right? We aren't passive little mounds of putty that the world presses on in that mindset, we set an active resistance, right? There's a bit of management that goes on, a healthy, nourishing management, which is my instincts well up and I push them away and continue, right? I override the onslaught of stimuli pushing me around in all directions. I override that nervousness. I override the hyperactivity and very actively resist, right? That tension, that moment where you, you can resist or you can fold isn't a sign that you're incapable of entering into these, uh, these really kind of wonderful generative moments. It is that moment, that is it, right? The, the choice to put up that resistance 
and to follow through with it and to continue doing that until you can sit in that for longer and longer and longer, right? That is the active Vita Contemplativa. That is nourishing, right? And relaxing and, and, and creative. There's a newness to it, right? Where hyperactivity is thought exterminating and uncomfortable and exhausting fatiguing, depressing, right? And, and that's what's so strange about this. The irony that that hyperactivity switches quickly, he says, abruptly into hyperpassivity. Now one obeys every impulse or stimuli without resistance. That's true, isn't it? You're so hyperactive and wired that you're actually remarkably passive, incapable of putting up any kind of resistance to those immediate stimuli, right? Those over, overwhelming feelings. You're just kind of pushed around by them. You take on a kind of fatalist approach to it. And he's saying that the, what we're really talking about here with the Vita Contemplativa is an active positing of resistance, an insertion, an intervention, a stopgap in that feeling. So hyperactivity becomes passive. And long, leisurely, contemplative moments become active. Of course they are. Only by the negative means of making pause can the subject of action thoroughly measure the sphere of contingency, which is unavailable when one is simply active. Although delaying does not represent a positive deed, it proves necessary if action is not to sink to the level of laboring. Today we live in a world that is very poor in interruption. Betweens and between times are lacking. Nietzsche writes that active men are generally wanting in the higher activity. In this regard, they are lazy. The active rules is the stone rules in obedience to the stupidity of the laws of mechanics, right? And then Han turns and he says, in the course of general acceleration and hyperactivity, we are losing the capacity for rage, which he says is something that is different from anger because rage is the capacity to interrupt a given state and make a new state begin. Today it is yielding more and more to offense or annoyance, having a beef which proves incapable of affecting decisive change, replaying an annoying moment again and again and again and again in your head, and not having a cathartic reaction to it as it's happening, an active resistance to a thing that's going on that you don't like, right? But instead stewing, festering, replaying it over and over and over again, saturating yourself with your own self-referentiality, with your own self-consciousness, saturating yourself with what you could have said, what you could have done, and what you could have, right? This is what I see what he's meaning here. Not, not a moment where rage would break in to be an interruption to that process. And instead of this prolonged, slow annoyance, everything then becomes annoying. In consequence, one is annoyed even by the inevitable. Annoyance relates to rage as fear relates to dread. In contrast to fear which concerns a determinate object, dread applies to being as such. It grips and shakes the whole of existence. Nor does rage concern a discrete state of affairs. It negates the whole. Therein lies its negative energy. It represents a state of exception. Increasing positivization makes the world poor in states of exception. Remember, Han's whole argument here is that we are in a time that is oversaturated with positivity, right? We have left behind the immunological age and we have entered into the neuronal age, to the, to the burnout society. No longer is that overarching epochal analogy um, one of contagion and immunology, of the spread of the enemy, of the spread of ideology, of the spread of actual bacteria and viruses that we were concerned about, of the need to keep a country pure from outsiders coming into it, of a need to keep ourselves pure from foreign invaders breaking into us and making us ill, making the country ill, making the world, Ill, whatever, right? That immunological fixation is one that is obsessed with negativity knowing what you are in your best state by what you are not, right? Drawing a clear line between that is not me, and if for some reason it ends up in me, it's got to get out of there, because I know it isn't. You repel it, you cut it out, you break it out. Not so with positivity, right? When he talks about, when he talks about the achievement society being the achievement subject, everything becomes internalized, right? You don't even really have an inside and an outside to distinguish between. When something is going wrong, the locus of that thing going wrong is within you. Right? You don't just get to vent cathartically at your boss. Right? You don't just get to vent cathartically at these external con conditions. All of them 
are more or less propagated by you. The mandates that are so exhausting are more or less set about by yourself. And you can choose to not do them, but then you will also not have the things you need to be alive, right? So it is this like constant relitigating volition it's a saturation that exhausts the positivity, right? He says, the fat that cannot be rejected because it is you. When you see the foreign invader, you don't get to pluck it out like you used to be able to. That's you. You're just taking out you. So again, increasing positivization makes the world poor in states of exception. We don't, we don't get those moments of disruption, right? We don't get those little moments of, of, of resistance, of a break in the contingency. Remember when he talked about how that positive dialectic broke broke a limit on the level of productivity possible with the older negative dialectic, right? I think that was in video, I believe it was in video, maybe it was in one or two. One might say that overexcited efforts to maximize performance are abolishing negativity because it slows down the process of acceleration. If man were a being of negativity, the total positivization of the world would prove more than a little dangerous. According to Hegel, negativity is precisely what keeps existence alive. And to clean up the language here a little bit, he says, when I say positive, the potency of a positive act, I mean it's your power to go and do something. It might follow from there that if we're in a society of positivity, then it will be a, a yes you can, yes you can, yes you can. Well, you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and you should be doing that, and you should be doing that. You don't in the four to sense get the clock out of work, and then work vanishes until you go back. You're at work and you're managing house affairs and you're at home and you're managing work affairs, if you even have an office to go into anymore, right? So that positive potency is that you can always do something, right? The negative potency would be the opposite. The power to not do something. The power to be able to enter into that long, slow gaze, to, to put up those means of resistance. If one had only the power to think something, thinking would scatter among endless series of objects. It would be impossible to think back and reflect, for positive potency only permits anticipation and thinking ahead. Ooh, that, that is home. The negativity of not to also provides an essential trait of contemplation. In Zen meditation, for example, one attempts to achieve the pure negativity of not to, that is, the void by freezing oneself from rushing, intrusive something, right? Such meditation is an extremely active process, that is, it represents anything but passivity. The exercise seeks to attain a point of sovereignty within oneself to be the middle. If one worked with positive potency, one would stand at the mercy of the object and be completely passive. Paradoxically, hyperactivity represents an extremely passive form of doing, which bars the possibility of free action. It is based on positive potency that has been made absolute to the exclusion of all else. When Fisher settles on the word impotence, reflective impotence, right? Capitalist realism, there's something there there's something there. Hyperactivity, this positivization of society, of late modern society, makes itself impotent by always anticipating the next thing and moving to the next thing and a saturation that exhausts, nothing gets done. Or what does get done may as well not be anything. I'm sure, I'm sure you've all been in situations where you've been in workplaces and, and, and the management seems very disconnected expecting so much that the only thing they'll possibly get by everybody scrambling is half-baked. Not really what they're looking for, but it works for the audit because efficiency looks like it's up. We're getting those tasks off the list. Efficiency is up 30%, but what, what's actually getting done? What things could look like if people had that negative potency, right? To be able to kind of leisurely sit and think about things and then suddenly what pops up out of that is kind of a radical, new, interesting thing that could be much more generative and productive. Not that it has to be, not that that's the point of it, right? The whole point is to not do anything. But this paradox he's pointing at is negativity. Negativity, the ability to not do something, isn't passive done right. It's very active. And that is the Vita Contemplativa at its highest form for him. And for all of the philosophizing and big ideas and big words and big references, that's something we've all felt before, I hope. I actually, I actually don't know that that's true. I, I, I really do know people who I, I wonder if they have been able to slip into those moments of kind of a long, slow gaze ever. 
I do have people like that where I wonder, but it's all something we can experience. And it comes out of that recognition, this Hegelian recognition. We're going to get into phenomenology of spirit at one point. Uh, my buddy Andrew and I are working through it together behind the scenes. God knows how long it'll take, but we're going to come back and um, we're going to work through that with everybody because it is phenomenal, wild, wild, wild book. But it isn't negativity good, positivity bad, right? This Hegelian this Hegelian approach that Han is bringing out is that both are, are constitutive of the other, right? It isn't all one or one all the other, but it also isn't, in kind of some what Todd McGowan at least can test or misreadings of Hegel, this really hollow gesture of not this, not that, but right in the middle. <laughs> not left, not right, but right down the center. The rational center, the enlightened centrist. The power of moderation. That isn't what we're talking about. That isn't what we're talking about. It is instead the baked in contradictions, the baked in contradictions between which we are animated. That encountering some paradoxes at these, at these core levels isn't a sign that, our, that our, our model for understanding something is faulty. We found it, that is the thing, right? You break the magnet in half and it still has an abrupt repelling and an attracting side. But that is a whole, that is a whole thing, that is a whole thing that we're, we're not going to get into at the moment. But the positive and negative that he's talking about here, they're a counterbalance to one another, right? Not in a moderation is key type of way, but they, they literally constitute one another. And if we're living underneath the overcorrection of one, the monopoly on, on lived experience of one, then we can have these little moments of resistance where we push up against it, flip it around, and bring out that other side of it, right? I don't think I've ever thought or done anything of value in a state of hyperactivity, but it's definitely the state that I'm sitting in for most of my life, despite being very conscious of it and very resistant to it. It's definitely the state I find myself in. And, and uh, anyway, I think this is a very practical, very practical couple chapters. And we'll see where he brings us after this. I know he's going to be getting into some Melville, that's one of my guys, so the Bartleby case. So maybe we'll read uh, the Melville short story on Patreon, and then we'll come back to the Bartleby case, and we'll begin wrapping up Young Chilhan's Burnout Society. It's a tiny little thing, tiny little thing. Okay, thank you all, uh, especially for your patience with me. I know it's been half a month since I've posted here. I, I'm very much a subject of the stuff we're reading, so sometimes that makes it hard to get the videos out, but it's always, it's always worth it. All right, see you next time. You know what? I, I'm actually, I'm not ready to leave you just yet. Uh, I have a recommendation, if you've made it this far. Um, look up Phantom Brickworks. It's an album. And listen to it, and, and do nothing. I'm a big ambient guy. We'll, 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 we'll do a video on that one day. Sometimes those things highlight negativity. They, they, it brings negativity in, because it is music that is definitely not hyperactive. You know? Ambient music, for those who don't know, comes from Eric Satie's furniture music, a classical musician and a composer. Music that he theorized could just be furniture, like wallpaper. You don't always know it's there. It's always so there that it dissolves into unrecognizability. It's just uh, ubiquitous to the point of invisibility. I think that's Fisher's way of phrasing that. And furniture music is the same way. You can focus on it or not but it's there and it does set the tone for the room and you know when it's gone, right? There's a kind of negativity, positivity thing in, in ambient music, in good ambient music that I think is worth mentioning. Okay, okay. anyway, anyway.